Hey, what's happening, y'all? You got that right. I got into the bleed train. And to be 100% honest, bleed builds are most likely the most powerful build of the entire game. The way they drop mobs and bosses' health is insane. A quick shout out to our sponsor, AOEF.com. If you don't have the time to grind for runes or items and need them real fast, use my code BAL for 3% off. I tested out three of the S tiers and most popular bleed weapon, and that is Rivers of Blood, Heliodorus Pole Blade, and Scavenger's Curved Sword. And one of them came out really dominant over the others. The good thing is that with this build, any bleed weapon will excel and make you really powerful in Elden Ring. So let's check it out. So in case you don't know, bleed builds are the most overpowered builds in the game. I decided to put it to the test using Rivers of Blood, Yugodora's Pole Blade, and Scavenger's Curve Sword, and see which one is stronger, and then we'll show you how to set up the build and how to play with it. So Rivers of Blood, a katana with mid-range combat with fire damage built into it. It cannot be infused with any Ash of War, so you're stuck with the weapon skill Corpse Piler, which is good, but to me it leaves you too, too open to counterattacks. The weapon is strong, uh, I'll get you that. And what I like is the mid-range reach, but when power stancing and hitting the left bumper, it only does one swing with each katana and it feels like feels like a great sword. I hope it was a little bit faster or make like a third or fourth hit. Next, I tried Eleonora's Pole Blade, also mid-range combat with fire damage built into it. I think it has less reach than the Rivers of Blood, but the weapon skill Blood Blade Dance makes it really powerful with the flurry of attacks that can break the stance of enemies real quick. But for this to happen, you have to connect the majority of times, and if the enemy moves or jumps, it's going to be difficult. And then I tried the Scavenger's Curve Sword, and Oh my god, with shorter reach, but faster, it hits like a truck. What I did like about this weapon is the amount of hit it does when you do a jumping attack, doing four sword hits as well, four hits when doing a running attack. And that is massive damage right there that you can do if you are all buffed up and can easily proc bleed on the enemy. The Rivers of Blood only did two hits when jumping and running, and Eleonora's Pull Blade you will have to power stance to have the four hits and only two hits when running attack if you are two-handing. And I didn't want to spend a lot of focus point doing the blood blade dance all the time. And the other thing that made me go with this weapon is that you can add Ash of War into them. So you can mix it up depending on your play style. I switch in between using two seppukus or one seppuku and bloodhound step. It's really up to you, but while power stancing, you won't be stuck with the default Ash of War like the other weapons. Now let's look at the attributes that you will need to create this insane build. The main attributes for this build is going to be Arcane and Dexterity. The only reason you want to go full Arcane is because of all the affinities. The one that makes this sword have more bonus damage with the attribute is the Occult Affinity. So the Occult Affinity scales E on Strength. D on Dexterity and B on Arcane. In this case, you see on this particular level 24 sword, it has 334 bonus damage. And compared to other affinities, it's the higher one by far. Also, maintaining a good bloodlust buildup to pre bleed faster on both swords. Our secondary attributes are Vigor, Endurance, Mind, and lastly, when you get to more than 150 level, spend points on faith uh, to be able to cast golden bow so for level 50 the only thing that you can do and need is to start adding the points uh, so when you reach to level 100 uh, you will get the majority of the items for the build the swords and uh, the black wet blade to infuse their cold affinity and the armor so the majority of the items you are gonna get them past mid game so in the meantime add more on dexterity first but Keep adding points in Arcane, so a good starting point could look like this. So for level 100, this is when you want to slow down on the Dexterity points and have more points into Arcane, although you will have one sword, so that will limit the build's power. So Vigor around 30, Mind at 12, Endurance 15, Dexterity at 30, Faith at 15, so you can start using Flame, Grand Me Strength, Incantation, and Arcane around 50. 
for level 150 plus is when you see the potential of this build you should be able to have all the items required and also a second sword you want to have bigger around 45 mine around 15 endurance almost 20 strength the same 20 as before dexterity around 40 faith now at 25 to be able to use the golden vow incantation and arcane at 60. and beyond 150 you want to get arcane at 80 the third soft cap and dexterity at 55 increasing vigor endurance and mind as needed for example vigor if you're going to do pvp or you think you need more health so now that we know how to use the attribute points uh, let's see what armor we need and this time it's not for fashion the majority of the pieces have a purpose in this build so the main weapon is the scavenger curved sword it can be found on a dead body in Mount Gilmir when you face a grafted scion enemy while heading up some wall ladders remember you will need to get two of these for this build the Ash of War that I'm using is a Puku on the off hand and Bloodhound Step on the main hand it's just a matter of playstyle you can easily run it with two seppukus seppuku is a very important in this build to activate a couple of buff that will mention when i talk about the talismans the seal i use is dragon communion seal that scales as with arcane and c with faith if you want to use dragon incantations with this build this is a seal you need but if you don't use any offensive incantations the finger seal will do on all bleed builds, the best helm to have is the white mask because it will raise attack power by 10% for 20 seconds once bloodlust has been inflicted on an enemy. It drops by killing one of the three nameless white mask NPCs in the Mogwin Dynasty mausoleum in Siofa River. It's the blood filled lake where the rune farming crow is. Be aware that if you kill the map boss, Mog, Lord of Blood, before getting the helmet, the NPCs will be locked and you won't be able to get it. The chest piece is another uh, that is very popular in bleed or physical attack builds and it's the Raptor's Black Feathers that will increase around 10% all jump attacks. When I show you the talismans and how to play this build, you will understand why jump attacks are a vital part of the damage that you can do. It can be found on a chest behind a magic wall inside Sage's Cave in Mount Gilmir. Since the helmet and chest piece are light in weight, we need to add a little more armor selecting medium weight pieces like the Crucible Gauntlets and Knight's Cavalry Greaves. I mean, you can choose whatever you want. What you need to do is select any combination of pieces without getting to heavy weight to avoid the slow rolls and maximize your resistances. The talismans for these builds are no surprise. It's what you see in almost every bleed build with some variations. The first one is Lord of Blood Exaltation. That will increase attack power by 20% for 20 seconds when an enemy is afflicted by blood loss. Using the Zepuku Ash of War will activate both this talisman 20% and the 10% of the White Mask. So you got 30% right off the bat. And Zepuku on this Arcana Cold Weapon will gain more bleed buildup. This talisman drops on Laidale Catacombs in the Royal Capital after defeating the boss Esgar, Priest of Blood. Next is the Rotten Wing Sword Insignia that will increase attack power by 6%, 8%, and then 13%, depending on the number of attacks you land. You can get it while finishing the Millicent questline and you decide to help her and defeat her sisters in the Halic Tree near the Drainage Channel grave site. This talisman will stack with our next one, and that is Millicent Prosthesis that will increase dexterity by 5 and will increase attack power by 4%, 6%, 11%, depending on the hits you land. Can be obtained finishing Millicent Questline, but designing to challenge her and kill her. So as you can see, we got two swords that are fast and the more consecutive damage we make, the more the buff we get. And last is the Claw Talisman that will increase jump attacks by 15%. It stacks with the jump attack buff from the Raptor's Black Feathers chest piece. Uh, you can obtain it pretty early in Stormvale Castle on a dead body on a watchtower. The Physique's Flask uh, will have the thorny Crack tier that will boost damage when doing successive attacks by 9%, 13%, and 20%. Last 3 minutes and it stacks with the Rotten Wing Sword Insignia and Millicent Prosthesis Talismans. 
it drops from the putrid avatar at the minor earth tree in west side of the mountain tops of the giants. And next we have the green burst crystal tier that will boost stamina recovery speed by 15 stamina per 3 minutes. It drops from the earth tree avatar in Kalid, east of a smoldering church. For incantations, we're only going to have, uh, you know, a couple of buffs. Uh, first, you will want to use the Golden Vow that will give 15% damage increase and 10% damage reduction and will last 80 seconds. And second and most important, Flame Grand Me Strength that will raise uh, by 20% your physical and fire attack power and will last 30 seconds. And will stack multiplicatively with Golden Vow. The way I recommend playing this drill is by doing a couple combos. Since the running attack and jump attack will do great damage because we're hitting multiple times and the talisman buff are proccing as well as the bleed ones. If the enemy is grounded, what you want to do is start with the running attack and when it finishes, do a jumping attack. If done correctly, you will land 8 attack in succession, activating the Rotten Winged Sword Insignia and Millicent's Rough Thesis. And with the jump attack, we'll activate the Claw Talisman and Raptor's Black Flare Piece. For boss fights, you want to do a combination of running and jumping, depending on the location and size of the enemy or what the enemy is doing. One thing to note is that when dealing with smaller enemies, you have to wait a little bit when you do the jumping attack, because when jumping, the first two hits are really high and it won't hit the smaller enemies. And that's not all. On top of that damage, if you buff previews with Golden Vow, Flame Grammy Strength, Seppuku on your offhand, and the Physics Flask, when you start doing consecutive damage, proc and bleed, and activating the talisman, you are going to deal an insane amount of damage. So I recommend doing the boss process when dealing with harder enemies. The Bloodhound step, as it were, will help avoiding attacks or getting near enemies to start over the attack sequence. And if you don't want to do the complete buff process every time, I know it's tedious, but you can at least buff with the Seppuku to prop the bleeding buff on the White Mask and the Blood Exaltation. My final thoughts on this build are simple. It's freaking insane and an OP build that will take advantage of every armor talent, affinity, blood buildup, Ash of War, Talisman, Incantation, and the Physics Flash tier, increasing the damage so high that you will down difficult enemies in a few seconds. And the good part is that this build works very well with another bleed weapon like Rivers of Blood or Eleanor's Pull Blade or any other bleed weapon if you do some modification. So if you haven't tried a bleed build, now you have to. And I hope this build guide has been helpful to you to achieve that. So slide that like button to get this video to more people. And if you don't want to miss builds or any Elden Ring content, please consider subscribing. Thank you so much guys for watching and as always, be safe and see you on the next one. Ciao!